Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 211, and this one is awesome right from the start. We play 25, 50, 100, so massive stakes. It's one of the one of the biggest games that I've ever played, and uh, I'm super excited to share it with you. Also, a handful of meetup games coming up. Uh, I have more information in the description box below. Um, all right, let's go ahead and begin. We're in Round Rock, Texas, just outside of Austin. I've had a good trip so far, chipping away at the amount that I lost during my first sessions at the Lodge in January this year. Today, we're gonna to be playing the highest stakes session of the trip. We'll be battling it out against three-time bracelet winner Doug Polk and a handful of other tough opponents in what's listed as uncapped 2550, but in Texas, games always have straddles, so it'll play even bigger than that. I arrive at the card room. I'm feeling some pressure, as I always do, to do well on the stream, but there's even a little more than normal because I'm doing a giveaway for any potential winnings. I shoot this video before the game starts to explain it. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm about to hop into the 2550 live stream game here at the Lodge. We got Skull Mike behind me. A fan made this for me, pretty sweet. So uh, massive game. I'm gonna be buying in for 10 to 15,000 and uh, I'm gonna be giving away 10% of my winnings to a random viewer. So if you tune into the Lodge live stream, you subscribe to the Lodge Live, and comment on the video, uh, you'll be qualified to win. Hopefully, hopefully I can make a lot for us. This is one of the top five biggest games I've ever played. I hear that most of the players are planning to buy in for 10,000. That seems like a reasonable amount to start with. Occasionally in high stakes, I'll sell action. I decided against that today. I'm completely on my own, and with the giveaway, I actually only get to keep 90% of any winnings. My mind has been on this game since I committed to playing it. I had a decent $1,900 win on the stream two days prior, but I'd like to get a signature win that has been elusive for me here at the Lodge. We make our way to the table, there's some good players in the lineup, but I come in focused and I'm ready to play my A game. Slick Rick and Skull Mike are in the booth doing the commentary. We look at the initial chip counts to start the game. Doug and Jay win, buy in for 20,000 and 15,000 respectively. The rest of us are in for 10,000. This game is huge. About a half hour in, we get an opportunity to get in the mix. By the way, there's at least one straddle on for every hand, so this one is 25-50-100. Doug has pocket jiggities and a second act preflop. He raises to 250. We've got something that we'd like to play. We're in kind of early middle position with pocket sixes. This is a spot where the vast majority of players are going to flat the initial preflop raise with a small to medium pocket pair under these conditions. That's totally fine, but I've been doing some studying with Nick Petrangelo for part of the cash game course that's still going to be coming out on upswing. It's just been pushed back a few months and is scheduled to be released in the fall now. Anyway, here's a look at the preflop chart Petrangelo gave me for this exact situation. You'll notice that you're supposed to play a tight range since there are still several players left to act behind. It's mostly a 3 better fold strategy. Even with 6s, folding well over 50% of the time is the correct play mixed in with some calls and some 3 bets that you see represented with the green. When I'm on stream, I try to take the more aggressive line as often as possible. The camera barely picks it up in the left of the screen, but I 3-bet to 700. It's not necessarily something that Doug or anyone else at the table would expect, and these guys are sharp guys. I need to do things that will occasionally catch people off guard in order to be successful at these stakes. Wow, Brad getting after it here, 3-bets to 700. Anybody want to from the fridge? Yeah. Owner on owner crime here. Partial owners of the club, Doug Polk, Brad Owen. Guys. Doug makes the call, which he's supposed to do around 80% of the time because often I'll have at least two overs, if not an over pair. My three bet with sixes is just a low frequency play. Sometimes when you take a risk, you get punished, and sometimes you get rewarded. The flop comes 10-6 deuce rainbow, we've got a completely hidden middle set, and what's even better is that Doug has an over pair to the board. Doug checks, we've got the second best hand possible in what's becoming a large pot. I want to make sure that we're able to keep the opponent in with a wide variety of holdings and possibly induce a check raise. We down bet to 500 to make it very enticing to at least stick around with a call. This board won't always be great for my range. Pretty regularly, I'll just have an ace high type of hand that Doug may want to protect against. Doug just calls, which I anticipated him doing with lots of hands, so this doesn't help me narrow down his range too much. He could have a 10, maybe two overs with backdoor draws, maybe small or medium pocket pairs, and there's some small chance that he has jacks or queens, but those are discounted since he didn't 4-bet us pre-flop, which he'll do at least some percentage of the time, and he didn't check raise us on the flop, which he'll probably do some percentage of the time as well. The turn is the 3 of clubs, it's a sweet card because no additional hands are beating us that are plausible. If Doug has 3s, we might be able to get it all in. If he has fours or fives, we can probably get at least one more additional street of value. Hands like nines and eights won't be afraid of the three either. 
Doug checks again. We need to start building this pot up a little more. Ideally, we want to set ourselves up to get all the money in on or by the river. I bet 1200 It's slightly less than half the pot. Maybe it's on the small side considering what Doug has and what I just stated is our goal, but it makes it seem as if maybe I'm playing cautiously or afraid of something, and it again provides an opportunity for Doug to check raise us. The smaller we bet, the more hands opponents can check raise us with. Doug's going nowhere for that price. He calls. Now I'm beginning to think that queens and jacks are a lot more likely, given that Doug has made it all the way to the river after I 3-bet preflop, bet on the flop, and bet on the turn. I still wouldn't be too surprised to be up against ace-10 suited, 9s, 8s, 7s, 5s, and 4s. The river is the 8 of hearts. I'm somewhat worried that we're up against a set of 8s. Other than that, it's a great card. I don't have to be concerned that Doug will have 9-7 suited because he would have folded that at some point preflop. Doug checks. I want to target his queens, jacks, and ace-10 hands because he won't be calling a third barrel with many other combos. Over pairs and top pair hands should be able to call a fairly large bet. I consider shoving for around 8,000. I might do that as a bluff with a hand like Miss Clubs, Ace-5, or Ace-4. I just don't want to squander this opportunity to make at least some money and give Doug a chance to get away from something like an overpair, which he's definitely capable of folding if I jam. I announce about a 4,000. A quick 4,000. And you see Brat, Doug's face, he's disgusted. He's got a bad feeling in his stomach, but I think he's going to lean on making the call, but what, what is really Brad doing this with? Is he really going to barrel three streets on me with a, a busted big slick, ace, queen, etc.? Queens plus have you beat. Tens, eights, possible sets. So Doug losing to a lot, and if anybody can make a good fold, it's the two seat. We've seen him do it. Vanessa, I mean, I mean Doug is deep in the tank, he hates the spot that he's in. I'm glad to see him thinking hard about this one because this is the first moment that I 100% know that we've got the best hand. Despite being in a difficult situation, Doug is still cracking jokes. I might be joining you on the stuck train here. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about boarding trains to Stuckville. Population one, currently with McLovin in the nine seat, buried 10K. Doug's travel plans sound amazing, but I'm doing my best to show no emotion. The longer that he contemplates what to do, the more likely it is that he has a top pair hand or an over pair. I know it, and Doug knows that I know it. You know what hand I have. It's your hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the jiggities. <laughs> Makes the call. Shows the set. And Brad Owen. Big pot. We get the call to win a huge pot against one of the main people who inspired me to make poker content on YouTube. I'd watched Doug and Jason Somerville for a long time before seeing Andrew and then eventually deciding to start my own channel. Studying Doug's Poker Lab course on upswing was also pivotal for my poker career, so while it's bittersweet to win against a friend at the table, this is a cool hand for me for multiple reasons. By the way, while you wait for the more comprehensive cash game course that Petrangelo and I will be releasing later on in the year, it may be helpful for some of you to get the fundamentals down with the Poker Lab. I have a link with discounts to it in the description box below. It certainly helps me quite a bit. We're off to a great start. We're second on the leaderboard, winning almost 7,000. If the session ended right now, this would be my third biggest win that I've ever had. I don't want that though. I prefer to be first on the leaderboard with my biggest win ever. The deck isn't too cooperative. About an hour goes by of us running cold. Then McLovin picks up ace-4 suited in the hijack and raises to 300. Bones hasn't beat with ace-jack off suit and cutoff. He 3-bets to 1100. Doug doesn't have a hand that he can call a 3-bet with. We don't have one that we'll be calling a 3-bet with either. We look down at ace-king off suit. We're going to play it. We're coming in cold with a 4-bet to 3500. This should look incredibly strong and rightfully so. No one really has anything that they can go to battle with. The opponents fold. I'm totally fine with that result. We didn't even have a pair, yet we add 1600 to the stack. I'm glad that we didn't get jammed on. Despite picking up very few playable hands over a fairly long stretch, we've been able to make the most with what we've been given. Nearly two hours in, Trey picks up King Jack offsuit in hand number 54. If you haven't noticed yet, there's a hand counter in the bottom right corner of the screen. That's one of several new additions to the revamped stream at the lodge. Trey's first to act, he raises to 300. It folds to Doug in the big blind who has ace-4 suited. It looks like he's thinking about 3-betting. Instead, he calls. We've got queen-10 suited in the under-the-gun straddle. At the moment, we have a tight image. I consider putting in a 3-bet squeeze. You can see it on my face that I'd like to do it. 
You can also see in another chart that Petrangelo gave me that when you're in the straddle and an early position player raises, followed by a big blind call, you're supposed to 3-bet Queen-10 suited around 40% of the time. When this course comes out and you see all the charts, it's going to completely change your game. In the meantime, I'll show you some charts occasionally in interesting spots as they come up. I like to just flat and close the action. We're going three ways to the flop. It comes ace, nine, deuce, rainbow. We've got nothing except some backdoor draws. Doug checks his top pair. We check. Trey wants to wrap the ace that Doug has. He bets 425. If Doug folds, my mind immediately goes towards the thought of check raising. Our hand isn't really good enough to call, but we have lots of cards that can help us on the turn. We can wrap hands like sets of nines and deuces, as well as ace nine and ace deuce. If Doug calls, I should just give up. But now that we're getting four to one, and with my tight image to fall back on in case we're not able to make a hand, I can perhaps cash in on the credit that I have built up and get a bluff through if I see an opening later. I make a speculative call. With no real draws out there other than to the wheel, it should look like I've got at least a pair, if not a monster, given the fact that I've overcalled on a relatively dry board. The turn is the deuce of clubs, giving us the flush draw and fake trips if we want to represent it. We're by far the most likely to be holding a deuce in our hand. If you go back to the chart, you see that we're supposed to be defending our straddle with all but three suited deuces. Doug checks, we check, Trey knows that the deuce is bad for him, he gives up and checks back. The bad news is that the river is the nine of spades, we break the flush, but we'll have a lot of full houses and sometimes even quads. Doug checks, he knows that I'll often have at least an ace, if not something much stronger. I didn't fly out with backdoor draws to have a perfect bluff opportunity fall into our lap and not take advantage of it. I bet 1200 into 2200. It should look like I'm trying to get called, and again, the only draw that missed is something like 5 4, so I'm gonna have a monster a ton of the time. Trey folds his king high, Doug has a much tougher decision. He doesn't beat anything that I'd be betting for value, including some aces like ace 10, ace jack, and maybe even sometimes ace queen. I'm sure that he has a sixes hand and the fact that I've played snug the whole session in the back of his mind as he contemplates what to do. Ultimately, Doug folds the best hand. You can't fault him for making the laydown. I took a strange line that I wouldn't necessarily always take if it weren't for some game flow factors at play. It's good to get that one through. Two and a half hours in, we haven't really lost any key hands. You can see that we've made our way to the top of the leaderboard now with a profit over 9,000. I've got the giveaway that I'm occasionally thinking about and would like the winner to get at least four figures. I also want to get involved a little more for the viewers. I'm just not able to do that with what I've been getting dealt. In hand 109, it folds to us in the big blind. We look down at 5-3 offsuit. This is a pure fold, but I call partially to get the V-pip up and because I expect my bluffs to continue to get through at a higher frequency than normal. If the under the gun straddler raises, I can fold. If he checks, I can fire on a lot of flops and take it down without a fight. Trey checks his option, we're heads up out of position, the flop comes king 8 4 rainbow. Any 9, 7, 6, deuce, or ace will give us a straight draw. As it is, we've got complete air. We take a stab for 125 though. Trey folds his queen 6 suited and backdoor draws. It's not a significant hand at all, it's just necessary to show that I'm trying to get involved when I see even marginal opportunities because this next graphic is embarrassing for me. We're at the absolute bottom of the VPIP ranking, only playing 12% of hands. It's not fun to get dealt so few playable starting hands when I'm aware that plenty of vlog viewers are watching and hoping to see me get in the mix. Sometimes you just can't pick out much though. I'm still focused and trying to play my best without forcing things too much. Four hours into the session, I've had two pocket pairs. One of those did go pretty well, but I can't help but notice that my neighbor to the right has had quite a few pairs to start with. The mic doesn't pick me up asking Doug a question that I immediately regret. He says when one of his pocket pairs was a set in a three bet pot, which is me that I totally paid off. Apparently, all you have to do is complain. We raised a 225 with pocket sevens, right in the midst of griping to Doug about not being dealt many pocket pairs. He sees this and thinks that it's comical that I may have gotten one. He has to get a sweat, and I let him see. There we go. You see? Yeah, let me get the two fifty. Uh, I, 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 I <laughs> wants to dance. He calls for 150 on top of his straddle with ace four. We're heads up in position, the flop comes 8-6-4 rainbow, we've got second pair in a gutter. McLovin checks, he's a really nice guy, 25 year old organ donor from Hawaii. This is a flop that I consider checking back on because it'll hit the straddler's range hard, even if it doesn't connect strongly with the opponent's actual hand, I anticipate getting check raised somewhat regularly. I make a calculated decision to bet 300 anyway, with intentions of calling a check raise with my pair in gutter. If I do get check raised, I have excellent card removal to some of the strong hands like 7-5 suited that the opponent will be representing. McLovin isn't sure bottom pair is good. He indeed puts in the check raise to 900 to represent mostly a set or two pair because that's what he has removal for. I stick with my plan to call for 600 more. 
not fully convinced that I'm up against anything that strong yet. The turn is another 8. I love seeing this card because it removes set and two pair combos that we could have been up against on the flop. A lot of players don't check raise hands like 9-8 or 10-8 on the flop since you don't necessarily have to turn those into bluffs, so I'm not too concerned about being up against just trips, mostly concerned about being up against full houses. McLovin looks a little uncertain regarding what to do. He chooses to continue firing, but he only makes it 1200. Doug knows what I have and is trying his best not to give anything away. I appreciate that. I didn't call 900 on the flop to fold to a $1200 turn bet when I liked the card that came out. I call, still not knowing exactly where we're at, but sensing that we've got the best hand. The river is another 8. If a second 8 was good, 3 8s on the board is better. We've counterfeited sets of 6s and 4s, as well as 6-4. In the off chance that the opponent has 7-5, we beat that now too. I already mentioned that a lot of players wouldn't have check raised with a single 8 on the flop, and there are only two combined combos of 8-6 and 8-4 suited, only one combo of 8-7 suited, and one combo of 8-5 suited. I'm McLovin it, as the opponent checks. I really don't think that I'm up against anything that has much value anymore. As long as we're not up against quads, we should have the best hand. There's a small chance that we're up against 9s or 10s. I'm not too worried about that though. I'm almost certain that McLovin was either bluffing earlier or at a strong hand that has been stripped of nearly all value. So how do we make money with this assessment? We bet Tiny to get called by a 6 or 4 or to induce a bluff. There's almost no chance that pocket 9s or 10s will reopen the pot with a check raise when I can have hands like aces, kings, queens, and a few quad 8 combos. So if we bet and get raised, we can be fairly certain that we're up against quads or a bluff. What is Brad going to do here? Brad's got to put his opponent on a 6 or a 4, I'd imagine, here. So he's going to be betting. Small bet, I think. Was that under 1,000 or was 500? So, so milky. Milky? Milky cookies? This is the second instance within the same hand that I bet small with intentions of calling a raise. McLovin had quads earlier against Doug, so he's reached his quads quota for the day. If he has it here and he raises me, good for him. I'm not a believer, though particularly after he checked the river and I bet tiny. It's a situation that's so annoying when you have nothing that you have to fight back every urge not to raise. There's no snap decision. The bet at 10% the size of the pot completely freezes the opponent. He's thinking, will a check raise work or does he want me to check raise him? Do I ever be anything? Maybe I should fold. How can a fold be right when I'm getting 11 to one and I have a full house? For almost two minutes, we don't hear a word from McLovin. I'm enjoying every second of putting the Irish R&B singer in the cage. To his credit, he's able to properly narrow down what I have. Is he disciplined enough to let it go, though? Yeah, such a good bet. Yeah, pocket sevens. Oh! oh pocket sevens. He called! He called his hand. A great call by McLovin. McLovin locked in, knows he's got sevens. He's going to pay him off anyways. Take him at 500. Wow, sevens. Fuck okay. <laughs> 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 Next time I'll slap raised. Oh. You might have just heard McLovin say that next time he'll snap raise me on the river, and in this hypothetical world, I said that I would have called. I bet with a plan in a spot where most people check back, we get almost every ounce of value we can out of a flopped bottom pair. Even though it's a smaller pot, correctly calling the check raise and the turn bet with sevens, and then getting our tiny bet called on the river, is at least in some ways more fun than the set of sixes hand. We're having a good time today as we're up over $11,000 on the session. We're in five figure profit territory and the giveaway winner will get four figures if we can maintain or add to our stack. The session isn't over though. In hand 117, we've straddled to 100. It folds to Doug. He has King Deuce suited. This is a combination that's a pure call for 50 more. He makes it. We look down and are happy to see Ace 10 suited. It's a monster in a blind versus blind spot. We raised to 300. Doug knows that there's a good chance I was going to raise. He calls with a suited king. We're heads up in position. The flop comes ace king six rainbow. We both get a piece. Doug checks. This board is so good for my range and even my actual hand. Plus, I don't think that it's going to be too great for Doug's limp calling range, particularly since two of the aces are accounted for. I check back to give Doug a little rope if he wants to try and rep an ace on future streets in the event that he has no showdown value or very little. The turn is another ace. Doug has a hand with plenty of value and he doesn't need to turn it into a bluff. He checks. It's time to start getting money in. I still don't think there are too many hands Doug will have that can call a bet, especially now that he's checked twice and three of the aces are accounted for. I bet 100 to see if Doug wants to get wild. If there's no need for him to, he just calls. There really isn't much out there. Maybe Doug has a king or a six. The river is the four of spades. It's a blank. Doug checks. I played this in a very deceptive way up to this point. We're going to go way bigger than we did previously to target really any other pair or a non-believer. 
Brad's going to go for the 100 turn bet to the $700 river bet. Makes the call. The call. Gets paid. And honestly, Brad has played flawless poker tonight as far as the hands he's been in. It's nice to run well in these types of situations. I've gotten some great runouts today. It's the exact opposite of what had happened in my first few stream sessions at the Lodge. We're doing great. Two orbits later, we find ourselves in a similar situation. Folds to Doug in the big blind. He's looking for a little redemption with this queen 10 offsuit and raises to 300. We've got ace three offsuit. We're supposed to call around 70% of the time and three bet the rest. We call, we're heads up in position. The flop comes four, four deuce with two hearts. Neither of us have too much, although we've got a gutter and the best high card. It's a paired board. Doug doesn't have to bet too large. He puts 225 out there. We could have the best hand, plus there's some cards like aces or fives that'll make us feel a lot more confident. We call. The turn is the nine of spades. No help to us. Doug isn't gonna let up. He keeps his foot down and fires for 850. This puts me in a difficult situation. I'm considering all options. Raising seems reasonable since I'll have significantly more fours in my range, and if we don't get the bluff through, we can perhaps improve on the river. Calling seems perfectly fine as well. Folding doesn't sound too bad right now, particularly since we've got a nice win going for ourselves and whoever is the recipient of the giveaway. I've done well at picking and choosing my spots. This one is easily avoidable. I'm still skeptical. You can see me say to Doug, I'm folding the best hand as I let the cards go. Doug gets it through. He doesn't lack heart and isn't afraid to put people to the test a lot of the time. It can be stressful when you're battling now with one of the best players in the world, especially in blind versus blind hands since it's so similar to heads up play where Doug literally was the best in the world at one time. You know what relieves some of that stress? When that cumulative winnings board appears out of thin air reminding us that we're up the most that we've ever been up. My previous biggest win was last September for 10,560. Since the stream broadcast is on a 30 minute delay, Doug and I are able to hop into the booth and commentate on our own play for the last few minutes of the stream. This is when I first realized how few hands I've played. Doug once had a VPIP of 4% halfway through a session he got a lot of flack for it within our ownership group. He's happy to pay that forward. Oh, oh Jesus. This oh, was what up, 4% nit Doug? What up, 4% wow. VIP, VPIP nit Doug? Knitting it up on the stream? And 13% more than a dead man. Wow. I mean, wow. I'm, I'm, I knew that my VPIP was going to be low. What was it on Wednesday? Higher than that. I'm sure, yeah. I don't recall Wednesday, completely. I got a normal distribution yeah. of cards. Yeah, yes. now, now who's the nit? Just saying, I got pretty wrecked. All you gotta that. do, Brad, is say, "Show me the cash." <laughs> Show me the cash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, laughing all the way to the cage. You never want to be the lowest. Uh... Here we go. This is. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, you both have king ten. Very interesting. So open from Bones, three bet from Brad. I should have known his hand because I was there at the table. But whatevs. Cool. Ready, Brad. Wait, you folded King-10 suited to you? Wow, Brad, capitalizing on your image here. That's what you get when you uh, when you have a 13% VP, if you get that respect. You did bluff <laughs> that <three> respect. <laughs> you did bluff like Doug it. earlier in, like a, in a nice spot. I, I mean, I just played the hands that were dealt. I'm always curious to see what hands I was actually dealt when I have low VPIPs. This is the first time I've really looked into it, though. I have my brother Matt make a heat map that you see here of all the hands that I was dealt. Combos in blue were holdings that I wasn't dealt at all. Yellow indicates that I was dealt the combo once. Orange is twice. Red is for three times. The purple color is four times. Then there's four three offsuit, which I was dealt five times. There's a diagonal section in the middle that goes from the top left corner to the bottom right, showing all the pocket pairs down the line. You can see that I was dealt only three the entire night. Eights, sevens, and sixes. You may remember the sevens and sixes went well. To the left of the pocket pair diagonal, we see unsuited hands. These are mostly going to be unplayable unless you're in late position or closing the action. Aside from ace-king offsuit, we won by cold four betting when we had that hand. To the right of the pocket pair diagonal is all the suited hands. I was dealt three suited connectors this session, including queen-jack, jack-10, and 9-8. I played all those, although none of them made for interesting enough hands to make the vlog. Then I was dealt only three additional suited broadways with ace-10, king-10, and queen-10. Each one of those hands were included in the episode earlier. I really didn't get much to play, which is certainly unfortunate in a lot of ways, but it doesn't take away from us winning nearly $12,000 against some tough opponents. It was a great time battling it out and getting a big win.
for five hours and won eleven thousand eight hundred dollars so that's the biggest win that i've ever had it's only the second time i've ever won five figures before uh, i got in the big hand versus doug early on uh, we battled quite a bit today so there were some fun ones in there you, you got me at the end yeah one, the one was a little more fun for one of us than the other but <laughs> yeah but a uh, good group of guys i didn't realize my vpip was 13 percent uh didn't yeah. feel like i got a lot of stuff to play um, but the hands that I did get to play, I feel like almost all of them went my way, which is, it was just really nice to have a session like this after that monster meetup week when uh, it was the exact opposite and I got wrecked. So I'm now officially unstuck at the lodge. That wow. feels really good. And, uh, and Doug is on his way to being unstuck. I'm but, glad uh, I could be involved in the process of you getting unstuck. I, I could be a contributing factor to the unstuck. I mean, look, like the thing is with the VPIP, like, I think it was last week, I saw a stream where it was like most of the way in, and I think I had 4% VPIP, which I think is a lie. I don't trust the VPIP at the lodge, but anyway, yeah. uh, sometimes you just have way more hands than other hands, and what are you gonna do? Like today I had a lot of good hands, and when you have those, it's gonna look higher. I, I don't know, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's obviously a useful stat, but it can be a little bit much in one session where you look at 100 hands of poker. Yeah. Yeah, so we're playing in some pretty high variance games, and uh, luckily the, it went, it went my way today, so real, real happy about that. Yeah, I had the Jiggities three times. I, t I, I told him, I, I think they might have had him as seat two, but he was seat three, so they were just sliding him over to me. Should we make should we make jokes like that? I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe not. I don't know, it's all good, it's all good. But, uh, all right, dude, good playing. Jiggies. Ethan Bennett ends up being the recipient of the $1,200 for the 10% giveaway. I'm happy to occasionally do this type of thing to give back to people who support this vlog and the Lodge Live. It's time to celebrate. There's no better way to do that other than head into downtown Round Rock with Skull Mike the Commentator, Mixon, and a few other poker players. We go to this place called Brass Tap. It's my new favorite spot in the area. It's good to have a few beers while the adrenaline from playing high stakes wears off. There's still a little more poker on this trip left to be played though. There's tons of action at the Lodge with our monthly monster event going on, leading right into the Lodge Championship Series. For days I wasn't playing on the stream, I gave updates on my Instagram account, which is why this clip is shot vertically of me getting it in preflop with Aces vs Kings on the last day of the trip. Aces holds for a $2400 pot against a viewer in a 1-3 game. Only in Texas is 1-3 play big enough for us to end up with a $3400 win on the session. This is by far the best poker trip that I've ever had. Remember from Monday's vlog that I was down almost $12,000 at the Lodge coming into this trip. But my first day here I won $23.30 and $2.5 before somehow losing $130 in a free roll. Then the next day I played the stream where I won $18.80. This session was highlighted in the last vlog. The day after, I lost $160 playing 1-1 PLO. That brings us to the session highlighted in this video where we won $11,800. The next session, we battled a grueling 8 hours and 45 minutes to grind out a $235 win. I was stuck about $2,200 at the low point, then won a 5k pot towards the end to get out of the hole. Finally, that brings us to the last day where you saw that we had aces over kings in 1-3 and won 34-15. In total, I played 7 sessions in 6 days and won over $19,000. It's by far the best week of poker I've ever had. You can see that I get completely out of the hole that I was in at the lodge, and I'm actually pretty profitable here now. Over 20 sessions total, I've won 7,500, good for 75 an hour. What's even more important is that I'm finally back on track for the year after a very slow start. For all sessions that I played in 2022, I'm up almost 17,000. The thing is that I've got several other big games that I'm planning to play so I can easily get stuck again at some point before the year ends, but I hope that's not the case. I'm just glad to finally have some nice wins and good memories of playing here. The games are high variance, but if you run well, you can win a ton. The staff is also phenomenal, including Fredzo here, who makes a huge tray of homemade enchiladas for me after I tell him how much I enjoy Mexican food. The good times are piling up here in the Austin Round Rock area. If you ever get a chance, you need to come check out the lodge for yourself. It's a special place. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons because it helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. This was a really cool session for me to have. It was my biggest win ever. It was on the Lodge live stream, uh, which we put a ton of time and effort into um, to, to upgrade and, and iron out all the kinks that we had a couple months ago. Uh, I was able to share this win with a viewer. I sent Ethan $1,200 and 
I got some redemption at the lodge. That first week that I was there, I got wrecked and it was all on stream. So it was good to finally run well, not have too many tough decisions. I obviously didn't play too many hands. And, uh, <laughs> but, but the hands that I was dealt, I, I won a huge majority of them and I, I feel like I got as much value out of them as I could. So very proud of that one. Um, if, you, if you haven't seen the, the previous vlog where I played on stream, I won on that one as well. And so this trip just went great and uh, it's good to have some, some nice memories of winning at the lodge. Um, I got out of the hole for that property. I got out of the hole for the year and the year is back on track. So uh, it was great to run well playing high stakes. I've got a few other plans to play some really high stakes games coming up. And I'm excited and nervous about those. Um, I, I'm not doing a profit goal this year because how I do for the year is going to be determined by just a few sessions where I play, you know, these outlier massive games. And I think it's just more important for me to have goals based around studying, getting more comfortable in high stakes and uh, developing more as a player. That's what I'm, that's what I'm focusing on this year. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got some meetup games coming up. I'm gonna be at the Lodge May 16th through the 23rd. Very excited about that. We're doing a meetup game May 22nd. And then Andrew and I are going out to the Hustler. We're doing a meetup game there June 4th and June 5th. Plus I'll be doing traveling with WPT. I've got some really cool plans with that. Very excited and I uh, hope to see you guys around the country and maybe, maybe even uh, some international travel coming up. Okay. Hope you're doing well, stay safe, good luck at the tables, and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to the Lodge Live YouTube channel. I have a link down below in the description box because I'm gonna be playing on there uh, and, and there's just gonna be some really cool streamed games and a lot of other exciting stuff coming from that channel. All right, see you next time.